If someone made a video titled, How to Reduce Your Risk of Being Involved in a Fatal Accident If You Choose to Drive Drunk, this would be a reasonable sequel, How to Use a Chainsaw from a Ladder. I had some real misgivings about making this video. It's basically telling you how to avoid the worst dangers of something you really shouldn't be trying to do. Working from a ladder is inherently dangerous. When that work involves a chainsaw, the work becomes considerably more dangerous. The first part of this video will go into why it is so dangerous using a chainsaw from a ladder. The second part of this video will address some of the ways you can reduce your risks if you absolutely feel you must endanger your safety. A ladder is basically a tool to allow you to move between elevations. They are not a good work platform. They are usually lightweight for portability so that you can move them easily from place to place and strong enough to support weight along the length. However, they are vulnerable because of their light weight to being pushed sideways and with a heavy impact, they can be buckled. The typical rung on an extension ladder is narrower than a gymnast balance beam. Therefore, climbing should always be done with two hands on the ladder and standing done with at least one hand holding on to the ladder. Especially when fully extended, they can twist along their length, allowing them to roll sideways off of a trunk. The chainsaw itself is a very dangerous tool, as it can cut the operator deeply, quickly, and severely. It needs to be under full control all the time. For almost all saws, this means it should be held with two hands. That requirement means that the operator will not have a hand free to hold onto the ladder. Additionally, in a lot of cases, the operator will have to reach. This will affect balance and make holding the saw even more difficult. Many people will not be able to hold a chainsaw with one hand. Even if they can, trying to exert the right amount of pressure on the trigger is nearly impossible. If the branch is large enough to justify the use of a chainsaw, it will probably weigh between 100 and 600 pounds, and it will have a lot of potential energy that will be converted to kinetic energy when the branch is sawed through we should take a look at the various ways that that kinetic energy can become hostile to the person who the, is attacking the branch. The pendulum attack is used by a branch that will be able to swing down without its far end striking the ground. If the end does not strike the ground, the branch will swing like a pendulum. In the bad case, the swinging pendulum may strike the ladder, knocking it out from underneath the climber, or off the trunk it is propped against. If the branch is compact and heavy, it may even cause the ladder to buckle and collapse under the weight of the climber. In the worst case, the climber may have been reaching up to the branch and the branch may have the opportunity to strike directly against the offending pruner. Note that a large cut branch will rarely fall straight down. As a cut nears completion, the uncut portion will become highly stressed in both bending and tension. If bending proves dominant, a pendulum swing will be initiated. If tension is dominant, the supporting stub will split moving the point of rotation closer to the climber and increasing the power of the swing. In the crouching tiger attack, the branch is long enough that much of its length may reach the ground 
before the butt is severed from the tree. With its outer end supported on the ground and its inner end still held by the tree, the branch uses its falling momentum to crouch in preparation for a powerful spring towards its attacker. If skillfully executed, a healthy branch can time its release and hurl itself upward to strike a savage blow at the cutter. A less well-timed release may mean the branch has to be satisfied with knocking the ladder out from under the climber. As branches become old, dead, and brittle, their ability to successfully execute the crouching a tiger attack diminishes and they have to satisfy themselves with the much less impressive falling crane attack. This technique seldom manages to strike the adversary, but it can succeed in knocking their ladder away. This advanced move requires almost perfect physical condition and superb timing, but can be very devastating when properly executed. The well-prepared branch must be fairly short, stocky, and curved. It must also time its landing to make contact on one end progressing to a roll and a flip up. True masters manage to accomplish all of this while also contacting the ladder hard enough to cripple it or knock it aside to dislodge their opponent. With the escape counterattack, the branch initially feigns submission and compliance. However, the branch is already prepared for this encounter. It has bent itself down using the weight of its outer length. Additionally, part of the bend in the outer portion has also added to pull the branch down. Success also requires the antagonist to underestimate the branch's ability to escape and to place their ladder resting against the limb well away from the trunk. The move must be timed precisely to when the antagonist cuts the limb off. Freed from that weight, the limb then springs forcefully upward, escaping from the lean of the ladder. The antagonist then begins a graceful descending arc to the ground. To add insult to injury, the climber will even lose the race to the ground. Before we start thinking ill of the tree for engaging in all of these nasty defenses, we should consider things from the tree's perspective. If you're cutting off a limb that's over 10 inches in diameter, you are probably engaging in an act that will eventually kill the tree. The tree's bark and cambium contain an amazing array of physical and chemical defenses against rot and insect attack. When a limb is cut off, that protection is removed and rot and insects can begin to attack the tree. If the cut is made just outside a branch collar, the bark can slowly grow to cover the wood and restore the protection. However, that regrowth can take years. The larger the cut area, the longer the wood will be subject to developing rot. If the opening allows moisture to seep to the trunk, decay of the trunk will begin and its progress will not be seen. After several years, the rot in the trunk may allow the tree to snap in a windstorm, perhaps crushing a home. One option is to play for additional time by not cutting the limb off close to the trunk. The stub will still die back to the growth ring fairly quickly, but by leaving a protruding stub, rot will have a longer path to travel before it can get to the trunk. 
By cutting the limb to make an overhang, the rate of entry of water into the wound may be reduced. Bottom line, if you are cutting off a limb over 10 inches in diameter, you are probably signing a slow death warrant for that tree. Regular treatment by a qualified arborist may be able to provide for the eventual healing of that wound, but the rate of convergence is usually going to be on the order of only a quarter inch per year. If you care about the long-term health of your tree, you will want to do as little damage to it as possible when removing a branch. The sequence for a large branch should involve four cuts. The first cut should be taken as a precaution when removing heavy branches. It should be taken several inches outside of the growth collar. With a heavy branch, there is the possibility that the branch will split along its length when cut three nears completion. If this occurs, the split can race back towards the trunk and the bark and cambium may rip for several feet down the tree. If that were to happen, the tree will be weakened and exposed for several years as it tries to seal over that extensive wound. Cut one is a shallow cut to make sure that any such tearing does not proceed past that fire break. On each side, the depth should be just through the bark, while the bottom should get a little ways into the wood. Cut two is tricky, especially if there is a lot of branch weight beyond the cut. If there is, the bending in the branch will want to close on the bar, and your chainsaw may be held tight. If that happens with a heavy branch, you will not be able to pull it out. If most of the branch has already been removed, cut two can probably extend halfway up through the branch. If the weight has not been removed, you should be very cautious about going even a quarter of the way up through the branch. With many cuts into logs on the ground, you can watch a cut carefully to see if it begins to close while you are cutting. If it begins to close, you should stop that cut immediately. Working from a ladder, you will only be able to see the near side of the cut. One way to judge the closing is to proceed very slowly and try to periodically wiggle the bar from side to side. If you get to where the blade can wiggle very little, it's time to stop progressing cut two and move to cut three. Cut three is easy to make but its completion triggers the most dangerous few moments of the entire operation. We will get into that in the section on perch maintenance. Cut four is made after the branch has fallen. It should be just outside the growth ring so that the meristematic cells do not have far to go to begin covering over the wound. Most homeowners either do not have a chainsaw or have a medium-sized saw similar to this or this. These are not appropriate to use when working from a ladder. You need a saw that you can conveniently use with just one hand. First, an out-of-control chainsaw can hurt you very badly, very quickly. Second, most chainsaws, especially traditional rear handle saws should be held with two hands. If two hands are holding the chainsaw, most of us have no hands left to hang onto the ladder or tree. If the branch is small enough on the order of only four or five inches, you should only use a handsaw on it and not risk going up with a chainsaw. For professionals, appropriate chainsaws for use in a tree have been around for quite some time. These in-tree saws are designed with the handles on top of the saw so that most of their weight hangs from the handles and they're easy to hold and maneuver. Unfortunately, professional grade saws are selling in 2023 for around $400 to $600 and it will be very rare to find a business 
that would be willing to rent one. Fortunately, the last two years have seen a practical explosion of new name battery-powered mini chainsaws that are lightweight and designed to be held with just one hand. They are available for around $60 to $120 with no established reputation to guarantee they will still be around next year or that they will work that long. They come in a variety of bar lengths. Six or eight inches is probably the most useful. If you plan to buy one, you should make sure it is at least as long as your branch is thick. The second saw you should use for this job is a decent hand pruning saw that will aggressively cut a wide kerf. While a regular carpentry saw or a bow saw will work, they tend to cut a narrow kerf, and that could result in a lot of sticking, especially if used in live wood. With all strategies that branches employ, their primary objective is to move the cutter rapidly to the ground. The primary counters to this, therefore, are to make sure that the ladder stays fastened to the tree and make sure that you can hang on to the ladder when something bad happens. We'll take a look at the first part of how to fasten the top of the ladder to the tree. The fastening should be able to prevent twisting about the trunk or sliding off of the trunk. If it can twist about the trunk, it might slide off or pivot about one foot, pitching the climber on the ground. It is not enough merely to pass a rope around the tree and tie its ends to the rung. Doing so, it can still slip on the tree. It's necessary to go around three times and make sure that the rope crosses over itself so that there's plenty of friction and it can't slip over itself. So getting that cross to hold the rope against the tree, that's vital. More important than preventing twisting, the fastening should be able to prevent movement down the trunk particularly if the bottom of the ladder becomes displaced by an impact from the branch or it becomes crippled or for whatever reason becomes shorter. You actually should use two separate ropes, one to prevent twisting and the other to prevent vertical movement. If you have the rope that's preventing twisting tightly fastened to prevent twisting, and you suddenly apply a vertical load, you're really increasing the tension in the rope and you might fail that rung. Your vertical support should come from at least a couple of feet above where you're fastening to your ladder. If there happens to be a branch at a convenient height, then that's great. But if not, you'll have to fasten to the trunk. There are all sorts of knots you could use for this purpose, but perhaps the simplest is just to use a conventional square knot. And you want to have enough length so that each end can go around a rung and around the rails on the outside. Having the rope fastened to the outside end of each rung minimizes the possibility of bending that rung should you suddenly apply a load to the ladder. Also, you want to have as little slack as possible so that you can't fall very far before your rope catches you. While those measures will make your ladder a much more stable perch, you also have to worry about your ability to stay on the ladder if you 
or it get knocked. Ideally you want to have at least three point support. As you get near the end of your cut, you want to make sure that your feet are braced as wide as possible on the rung and that you have a firm grip on the ladder or a convenient branch before you finish the cut. One important word of caution, do not tie yourself to the tree. If you do and your ladder will get knocked away, you'll be hanging there with your weight, you won't be able to untie the knot and you'll be hanging there until someone rescues you or until you cut the rope and fall anyway or until you die because with your weight on that, that could slip up around your chest and suffocate you. So don't tie yourself into the tree. As you complete your cut, you'll want to be hanging on to your ladder or a good branch above your head. If you get your feet knocked off of the ladder and fall a couple of feet, it'll be very hard to maintain your grip if you're holding here and falling like that. So grab high when you complete the cut. If you're using a chainsaw to cut off a branch, you will reach a point in time where the branch begins to fall and become an active threat. And you will be holding a dangerous running chainsaw in your hand. And three, you should be holding on to the ladder with two hands. This requires dropping your chainsaw. If you drop a chainsaw from a ladder, you stand a good chance of damaging your chainsaw. If you're not going to be dropping your saw, you don't want to be on the ladder with your chainsaw running when the branch goes. That may happen so quickly that you're not going to have time to set the brake, turn the saw off, and drop it around the tree. And then safely grab the ladder. Even if you could do that, you just can't risk the branch falling, hitting the chainsaw, and sending it whipping around the trunk at you like a grade school tetherball. The much, much better plan is to only use your chainsaw until it is reasonable to switch to a handsaw. Then, with the cut nearly complete, you can lower your chainsaw down nearly to the ground swing it and drop it someplace where it's unlikely to get hit by the falling branch and then finish the cut with your handsaw. You probably shouldn't try lowering your chainsaw to someone else because the branch might choose that moment to pounce on them. If you're finishing your cut with a handsaw it should be a very easy matter to toss your saw someplace where the branch won't land on it. This will rarely hurt the saw. Though, if you drop it on a hard surface, you might crack the wooden handle. The blade will almost never be damaged. So far, we've looked at how to avoid falling when a limb strikes your ladder. What we need to look at next is how to prevent each such attack. The purpose of limb control is to prevent the limb from striking you or your ladder. There are several cutting plans that can be used, but it is critically important that the plan you select is appropriate for the geometry of the limb. We will look at several typical limb geometries. First, let's look at the pendulum attack. As you saw earlier, a limb will try this tactic when it is cut from above and is short enough to swing inward from the bottom of the cut without striking the ground on its swing. You can prevent this swinging about the bottom of the branch by making your first cut from the bottom upwards. If the branch is long, its weight and long moment arm will be bending it down quite strongly 
and cutting up into the bottom will soon result in your saw getting squeezed and locked in the kerf. As you cut upward, you need to pay close attention to whether the kerf is beginning to close and stop cutting and remove your saw as soon as you can tell the kerf is beginning to close. With any luck, you may be able to get a quarter to a third of the way up. Under best circumstances, you may be able to get over halfway up. With the bottom partially cut, begin cutting down from the top. For a roughly horizontal branch, you should aim to meet the initial cut. As you weaken the section, the bottom kerf will fully close and the branch will not be able to swing down any farther. When you complete the cut, the branch will break free and will fall essentially straight down. For most homeowners, the branches they will be interested in removing will be the lower branches on a big yard tree. The yard trees differ from forest trees in that they tend to grow their branches, their lower branches, more or less horizontally to reach out to the light that's available to them. In a forest, that light isn't available, so the branches tend to be more upright and high. But on a yard tree, you have a good chance that that lower branch is growing out and down, increasing the risk of the branch touching the ground before it separates from the trunk. If the limb you are planning to cut is inclined steeply upward from the trunk, this may improve your options. However, you must pay particularly close attention whether that limb is free to fall or likely to get caught in an adjoining tree. If its fall is unimpeded, you may be able to get your branch to fall away from the trunk, you and your ladder. The idea is to get it to pivot about your cut until it is nearly horizontal and then falls off of the step. The technique involves making two cuts, one from the bottom up and the second from the top down, but positioned closer to the trunk. To prevent your saw from getting pinched, it may be prudent to temporarily fasten the branch up until that bottom cut is completed. The cut from the bottom should extend close to halfway up through the branch. Then the support can be gradually released. Ideally, you will have a helper available to take the rope and, from a safe distance, exert a gradual pull on the branch as you complete the cut. One thing you don't want to do is leave that rope up in the tree where it might get tangled in the branches and end up pulling the falling limb back towards the trunk and your ladder. The next step is to make a cut down through the top of the branch. The objective is to make a shelf that the branch will rest on as its top begins to fall. As the top begins to fall, the center of gravity of the branch will be moving down, but, more importantly, it will also be falling away from you and the trunk. When the branch is pivoted far enough on the shelf, you want the butt end to fall off of the shelf so that the branch can fall more or less flat. You want the branch to rotate off the shelf when the branch is just shy of reaching horizontal. To do that, you want angle A to be a bit larger than angle B. If judging angles is not your thing, just make the step half as long as the lower cut for steeply rising branches and a third as long as the bottom cut for less steeply rising branches. Two things are important when using this technique. One, your cut needs to be perpendicular to the direction you want the branch to fall. Second, the cuts should not be sloped from one side of the branch to the other. Reaching up to make either cut is a bad idea. If your steeply inclined branch is likely to have its fall impeded, things get more complicated. In a favorable case, the far end of your branch may get held up 
so that the butt end where you are making your cut will rotate down and away from you. In an unfavorable case, the impeding tree may push your falling branch back towards you so that the falling butt end strikes the bottom of your ladder. Even with experience, it can be very difficult to predict which behavior will occur. If you are dealing with a limb that weighs more than 78 pounds, you should be concerned about more than how to secure your ladder and how to cut the limb. That falling limb will generate a lot of kinetic energy and you should probably try to exercise some direct control over how and where that limb falls. We will take a look at several options for directed falling, starting with some of the tools you may need. The most important of these will be a good rope. The rope you use should have more than adequate strength to support the branch. You will also need lesser tools to position that rope where you need it. I have a throw line and throw weight, a bag of shot, that are made for that purpose. The main requirements are that your throw line is strong enough to haul up a strong main rope. Don't forget that pulling over a branch you have a lot of friction added to the weight of the rope. So this has to be a good strong throw line. Rather than buying a slick line and shot bag, you can get the same result with a long strong string and a weight such as a bunch of large washers or a leftover weight from a long dead hoist. However, you can come up with many acceptable alternatives. In one simple case of directed falling, the branch to be taken down has its outside end relatively close to an adjoining tree. First, we toss our hauling rope up over the doomed limb. If the limb is difficult to throw the rope over, we may start by tossing our throw line over it and then hauling our strong rope up over it. Next, we need to create a noose to fasten tightly around the branch. The bowline knot is ideal for this. Now you have created a noose and only need to pull it up to tighten it around the branch. Ideally, the adjoining tree will have a convenient crotch a bit higher than our tiger branch and we will be able to get our throw line through that crotch. Once the throw line has finally cooperated and gone through the right crotch, we remove the weight and tie the throw line to our rigging rope. Then we pull the rope up through the crotch and back down to us. Next, tighten up the rope lifting the limb as much as possible and tie it off around the tree trunk. With that all in place we have made it so the branch will swing away from us when we cut it free. If your target branch is not too high off the ground and is level or slightly drooping you may be able to brace it to get it to fall away from you and your ladder. You can usually purchase lumber in lengths of up to 16 feet. You will need two pieces that are each a couple of feet longer than the distance between the ground and the bottom of your branch near its balance point. Drill a hole through the end of each board and string a short rope saddle connecting the two ends. The length between the two boards should be just a bit longer than the width of the branch. One end of the rope will need to be at least 20 feet long or longer. Jam this bracing pair under the branch with a distinct lean away from the trunk. Ideally you will be able to place it near the balance point of the branch. Ideally, 
there will be a fork near where you want to place the brace. If there isn't, you will need to tie the brace back to the limb to hold the brace in place. Make sure this tie back is fastened to part of the branch that will fall and is not tied to the trunk. If the branch has an upward slope, you will definitely need this tie back. As you cut the branch, its weight will begin to transfer to the brace. The brace will exert a force on the branch that carries its weight and pushes it away from the trunk. Depending on its weight distribution, the butt of the branch may rise or fall. If the branch is laterally off-center, it may also try to fall sideways. The closer the branch's center of gravity is to your bracing point, the better balanced its fall will be. Note that this bracing can move the fall of the branch well away from the base of your ladder. While a moderately heavy branch can be momentarily supported by 2x4s, you should get 4x4s for a really heavy branch. In some situations, you may not have another tree close enough to rig to, and your major branch may be too high to brace. To prevent the butt of the branch from smashing into your ladder, you may be able to rig the branch so the butt will stay essentially where it is when you cut it free. To do this, you need a strong rope and a good crotch that you can throw a rope through, preferably one on the same side of the trunk as your branch. The rope should be tied around your branch, preferably no more than six inches out from where you plan to cut the branch off. The rope should be lightly tightened and then tied off. If another anchorage is nearby, it would be preferable to wrap the rope around the trunk two or three times and then run it to that other anchor point to tie it off. If this can be done, it will be easier to untie the rope and use the friction around the trunk to slowly lower the branch once it is cut free. The static rigging process does involve several risks. One of these is that there is a risk of getting your saw bound into the cut. This can be reduced by starting with the removal of a slice from the bottom of the limb in the same manner as you would cut a notch when felling a tree. When the final cut is started on the top of the limb, this notch should allow the limb to fold down with a slightly reduced speed. The hinge should prevent movement to either side and remove the risk of binding that lateral movement would create. Another risk is that if tied too far out, the cut end of the branch will rotate quickly up or if the support crotch is above your branch and too low, the butt will swing back at you. Additionally, even if the butt is held, the rest of the branch may swing down to strike your ladder. All three of these risks can be significantly reduced if the outer end of the branch can be captured and restrained with the tagline before cutting begins. Regardless, the final top cut should proceed slowly so the branch can gradually dip before it finally drops down. Once the branch is swung down as far as it is going to, you can climb down and remove the ladder, untie the rope from its anchorage, and then slowly lower the branch to the ground. I hope that this video has made it clear that you can have severe consequences if you use a chainsaw from a ladder and that there are many different ways that those bad consequences can be triggered. While this video has attempted to show you some of the steps that you can take to reduce the likelihood of a bad outcome, it must be stressed that you can still experience severe injury even if you follow all of those steps. Before getting your ladder out, you should consider carefully what the branch will do from the moment it falls free to the moment it's lying on the ground. 
the higher you have to climb and the bigger the branch is, the more likely it is you should hire a professional to do the job. Any Patreon support you can provide will go towards the production of How to Reduce Your Chances of Causing a Fatal Accident If You Insist on Driving Drunk.